The city of York in the north of England is very famous for its history of many different periods and two weeks ago at the weekend I was in York with my reenactment group where the city had the Jorvik Viking Festival where as the name suggests it looked back specifically at its Viking history. And this got me thinking, let's make a video about the Viking Age in York. What did the Scandinavians do in York? Because I think this is a really interesting topic. So really, the Viking Age in York begins in 865 with the coming of the Great Heathen Army. Now at first, they didn't actually land in Northumbria. They landed in Thetford, which was in East Anglia. But they got horses from the king there called Edmund, and they went north to the town the Anglo-Saxons called Eofawick. Now, Eofawick had been known to the Romans as Eboracum. Eboracum was an important place for them because they actually had a garrison there. And of course, the Great Wall to the north was Hadrian's Wall, and this was essentially the main northern base for that wall, the largest city there. It's probable that the name comes from the Celtic Abrauk, which means something like the place of the wild boars. Now, when the Romans left, the Anglo-Saxons took over and they called the place Eofawick, which is, again, a sort of bastardization of the Roman, making it sound a bit more Germanic with the wick ending. Now, at the time, this became the capital of one of the sub-kingdoms of Northumbria called Deira, and it was an important place. Edwin built a baptistry there, which is a kind of church, and it became one of the dioceses at the time. And it was also a trading centre, being at the heart of one of the European trade lanes, trading with places like Scandinavia, Frisia, Franca, Francia, the Baltic, as well as places like Ireland and Pictland, other places in the British Isles. So it's very likely that Scandinavians, or in fact it's pretty much certain that Scandinavians knew about York and that they had traded in York, trading various materials, uh, possibly even slaves, maybe trading things from the Baltic like ambers, definitely trading things like furs or timber from Scandinavia, which is what they traded. So Scandinavians already knew about York before they attacked it in 865. And actually they left soon after they arrived in Eofawick and they went south, but when they returned they were actually besieged in York by two Northumbrian kings. One was called Ayla and he isn't very much liked in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle because it said he usurped the throne from another king called Osbert, but they joined together and attacked the Vikings, although it ended very badly for them as they were both slain in battle, meaning that the Vikings, the Danish army, the great heathen army, could wrest control of York from them for good. And it's at this point that York and the land around York to roughly where the River Tees is, which again roughly was the old Anglo-Saxon sub-kingdom of Dera, became under Danish rule. Whereas more to the north, above the River Tees, the older uh, Northumbrian kingdom of Bernicia held out against Danish rule. While to the south, you had the various Anglo-Saxon kingdoms of Mercia, East Anglia, Wessex and Kent which again would fall all of them very soon to the Danish army, with the notable exception of Wessex, of course. Now, the land that the Danish uh, people conquered at this time was called the Danelaw, and a lot of Danes would come to settle there. It was called the Danelaw because that's where the Danish law was the law of the land. It's where they ruled. And of course, Wessex would later on be the great power with Alfred the Great and other kings like Edward the Elder and Athelstan, who would later on reconquer the land that the Danes took from the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. Now, it's very interesting because actually in 872, the Northumbrians of York rebel against the Danish rule and they actually take the city over. But the Vikings soon get their own back. And what's interesting is that the church, actually, the Archbishop of York, supported them. And the Viking king Guthred was actually buried in York Minster, which is a very interesting connection between the church in Northumbria at the time, who very possibly was sick of all the infighting going on between the various factions and saw the Danes as potentially a new hope, even though they were pagan still at this time. And he was actually, although King Guthrid was a Christian, he was buried in York Minster, as I said. And in 875, a new ruler called Halfdan Ragnarsson, son apparently of Ragnar Lothbrok, which is one of the main reasons the Great Heathen Army went over in the first place, took control in 875. And it's at this time that York is turned into a real town with proper trading connections, especially to Scandinavia. Lots of Danish migrants came and settled in York, which made the population a lot larger. Now, obviously, it had been trading beforehand, but essentially with the Danish in control, they were a sea people. They really had strong connections, and this really changed the nature of trade as well as the nature of the city itself. And we actually see that the name Jorvik comes from, uh, the, it's obviously an Old Norse term, and that's where we get the name York, 
the kind of languages simplify as they get older. So essentially, um, when you have Jorvik, it, if it turned into York because it was easier to say. And actually, Jorvik is just another bastardization of the Anglo-Saxon bastardization of the Roman bastardization of the Celtic name. So the Anglo-Saxons were calling it Eofowik, whereas Jorvik is a more Norse way of saying that. There is actually some debate as to whether the V in Old Norse is pronounced in as a V, as in valiant, or if it's pronounced as in a W, as in where. So it might have been Jorvik, which again sounds a bit more like the Anglo-Saxon. But essentially, it's from this word that we get the modern name York, although essentially that technically goes back all the way to the Celtic name. And actually, there are a lot of place names in York that have Norse origins. In fact, um, I think most of the streets in the centre of the city do. Now, you'll see that a lot of them end in gate. And actually, gate comes from the Old Norse word for street, which was gata. So you see a lot of them, like um, Gudrum Gate was Guthrum's street. Other places like Swine Gate was where they kept the swines, the pigs. Hun Gate was where they kept the dogs, related to the English word hound, or more closely to the West Frisian word horn, which also means dog. Places like uh, Castle Gate was obviously where they built the fortification. Mickle Gate was the big street. Mickle in Old Norse meant big, like in Mikkelagard, that's the name that they had for uh, Constantinople at the time. And actually in some northern dialects, including in my own, you sometimes call someone Muckle, that means they are big. So again, that's another little connection there. Another interesting one is King's Staith actually means King's Landing. That's probably where the king would land when he arrived along the River Ouse. And Skelder Gate is another interesting one. That is Shield Maker's Street. So you sort of get an idea. Um, Copper Gate as well is obviously where they're working metals and things like that. You get an idea of sort of what's going on in York at the time in just from looking at the place names. And if you visit York today, you can see all of these streets um, just on the street signs. So it's still a very visible reminder of the uh, Old Norse and the Scandinavian presence in York. The Anglo-Saxons to the south obviously weren't thrilled about having Norse neighbours to the north, which is a fun bit of alliteration to do. And actually one of them launched a raid into Mercia to collect the relics of the dead King Oswald. Saint Oswald was one of the earlier 7th century Northumbrian kings. And this prompted the Danish Northumbrians to actually attack this new raiding party. And they decided to have their own raid into Mercia, at which point they were caught up by the Anglo-Saxon army and the kings Eowils, Halfdan and Ingvar were all killed in the disastrous battle of Tettenhall. Now it's at this point that from across the um, sea they are then given a new king. And the next line of kings that they had were called the Ui Imar. And the Ui Imar and um, probably butchering that so I'm gonna get some raging Irishmen in the comments but oh well um, where the it's it's the Irish name for the grandsons of Ivar and Ivar is most likely Ivar the boneless he's potentially also called Hingvar in some of the uh, sagas and by the Anglo-Saxons and he was one of the leaders of the great heathen army and these kings included people like Ragnall, who was also an Irish king across the sea, as well as the King of Man at the time, the Isle of Man was also one. And later on you get people who were also the King of Dublin, uh, as well as other places in Ireland, which had been become colonies in Ireland, these cities, um, that mainly the Norwegians had established, but the Ui Imar were the ones who were the ruling dynasty of these areas. And then York became intrinsically linked to the Scandinavian enclaves, especially Dublin in Ireland, with kings like Sigtrick and Gofrith as well. And because of this, really, York got a very multicultural character of its own. Obviously, you then had people from Denmark from the original invasion, and the rulers were Danish at the time, of course. When I'm saying Danish at the time, that didn't really mean too much, but it's just interesting to look at, as well as Norwegians. They came over in smaller numbers. There is some linguistic evidence for that, and obviously later on, the Norwegians would become very important. You also had the, obviously, the natives, so the Northumbrian natives of York. Lots of the Anglo-Saxon population remained. We can see that through genetics, through uh, place name evidence, and all of that. They weren't wiped out. 
Um, obviously, of course, they were trading with various trading peoples, prominently the Frisians. We actually have a story about the Frisians being kicked out of York at one point because a Frisian trader killed a nobleman's son, which, you know, wasn't great. But that's, you know, it's just another bit of evidence there, as well as uh, other, other trading things like finding scatters around about the place, as well as then various Celtic peoples. So both from the Brythonic Celtic peoples, as well as the Irish, Irish obviously from the potentially coming over as slaves or to trade again through the Dublin connection. And actually one of the streets that is now called Jubbergate in York what used to be called Brettergate. And Brettergate, Brett is for Britain. And it's thought that these were this was the street or the area where Britons lived, probably from Cumbria, which is an area in the northwest, sort of on the other side of the British landmass to uh, Northumbria at the time. And it's interesting that then there would be a very mixed multicultural character in York. And this is also reflected in the language that started to be spoken there. One of the reasons why we use there, as in T H E. I R, and not the more Old English forms, is because of this close connection between the Old Norse language and the Old English language, especially in the North. And why I keep bringing up Northern dialect words is because a lot of them are related to Old Norse words, because these words and um, various words in Standard English as well, like leg and skull, started to be used interchangeably. And it's also why in Modern English we no longer have the case system which is still used in German and was used in Old English because it, it was easier to communicate with each other in such a multicultural environment like York if you just drop the case system because then the Scandinavians would have a much easier time conversing with Northumbrians, which is another interesting linguistic tidbit there. By the early 10th century, the Anglo-Saxon kings of Wessex, such as Edward and Athelstan, were already back on the front foot, and they were started pushing north, then retaking East Anglia and the kingdom that had been the five boroughs uh, that were Danish kingdoms. They took these kingdoms over. And of course, Northumbria, the kingdom of York, was the next one in their sights. However, they didn't actually take this by force, and what Athelstan did was he married his daughter to Sitric or Sigtrigr, who was the king of York at the time. However, he died a year later, and when he died, he fully incorporated York into the Kingdom of England. Now, Guthrith had a son who was called Olaf, and Olaf actually allied with the Scottish king Constantine, and they met Athelstan's unified English army. Athelstan was the first king to unite England as a country, at the Battle of Brunanburh, somewhere along the west coast of England. And although he was defeated in the battle by the English, very famous, very bloody battle, there's a beautiful Old English poem written about it, um, the English king actually died in 939 AD. And following his death, actually, Olaf did become king of York, and obviously he was already king of Dublin at the time. So once again, the Kingdom of York, the Scandinavian king, had been re-established. And after his death, there were more Hiberno-Norse, so sort of Irish Norse with the connection to Dublin, kings in York. And that is until we get to the reign of King Edmund. And at this point, we also have to introduce the next major character in the story of the history of York, which is the Norwegian king, Eric Bloodaxe. Now, Eric Bloodaxe is a very famous figure, and one of the reasons he's called Bloodaxe is because he killed most of his family. Now, his father was called Harald, and Harald had divided the Kingdom of Norway, which had been um, not uh, unified that long ago by another king called Harald Fairhair. And he divided Norway between his sons. But Eric had his two half-brothers, Roggenwalder and Björn, killed in in deceptive manner, we are told. And then he defeats first his half-brother Olaf, and then his other half-brother Sigrid in battle. And he became the sole king of Norway at this time. However, he had another half-brother, actually, which, interestingly enough, he was staying at the court of Athelstan. So the same Athelstan who united the kingdoms of the English. And he was called Harkon. And Harkon came back. Um, the king at the time, obviously, Eric Bloodaxe, was unpopular with his nobles because he was a hard ruler. Apparently, he was a tyrant and he taxed people too much. So when Harkon came back to Norway, the nobles kicked him out. And after a brief spell as the Jarl of Orkney, the then Eric Bloodaxe set his sights on Northumbria and invaded the place. 
However, in 947, the English king Edred actually went north and burnt Ripon Minster. Although on this raiding party by the English king Edred, he was caught by Eric Bloodaxe's army and they sustained very heavy casualties at the Battle of Castleford. However, even though Eric Bloodaxe won the war, he then lost the kingship because the English actually decided to pay the Northumbrians more to accept them as their king. Although he did actually soon return as king of Northumbria in 952. Although at this time the Northumbrians were really getting sick of Eric Bloodaxe, who turned out not to be a very good king. And one of his reeves, so one of the important uh, eldermen in his kingdom at the time, a Northumbrian called Osulf, led a rebellion against him and at the Battle of Stainmore, an incredibly bloody battle, he and his army were cut down by the Northumbrians. And once again, York was incorporated into the Kingdom of England, this time as the Earldom of York. And at this time as well, once again, to highlight the, um, the fact that there were so many different people coming into York. In fact, in the early 10th century, they, we have evidence that they, they hugely expanded the city because there were so many people coming in. Again, people like the, the Danes, Anglo-Saxons, people from across the Irish Sea with the connection to the Kingdom of Dublin at the time from dating the uh, logs in York that we have found at the time. We know that in the early 10th century, they really had to build a lot more houses because there just weren't enough houses to uh, populate the people that were coming into York. Now, the next thing that we need to look at is uh, obviously that York then became the second city of England and sometimes it's called the second capital. And by the early 10th century, York was the, or the early 11th century, sorry, York was second only in population to London in the southeast of England, which really goes to show how much the Danes and, uh, to a lesser extent, the Norwegians did for York, the amount of people that they brought in and attracted with their trade and with the things that were then on offer in York, thanks to their connections across the various seas that surrounded them. Now, the next real Viking that comes to York is actually Knut the Great. And Knut the Great was actually just a Danish prince at the time when he invaded England. But later on, he would become famous as the ruler of the North Sea Empire, which consisted of England, Denmark and Norway. So it was one of the largest empires at the time. Very interesting figure. And in 1016, he invaded England. And at this time, obviously, all of England was taken over by the Danes after a, a brief struggle against Athelred, who was famous for being very unready, and also his son, Edmund Ironside, who really is an interesting character and put up a very stalwart defence against the Danish invasion, although ultimately he was defeated by Knut the Great at the time. And York then became simply a, another earldom with Jarls this time, which is just the Old Norse world for earls being reinstated there under Knut, and then his sons under Hartha Knut, and also another son called Harald Harefoot. Until 1042, at which time the English took over again in the form of Edward the Confessor. And it's actually in the reign uh, following Edward the Confessors in the fateful year 1066 that the one of the last Viking players in the story of York, actually Harald Hadrada, comes into it. So Harald Hadrada was the king of Norway at his time of the in invasion of England. And actually, he has a very interesting life story, including sort of Slavic princes in Russia uh, fighting with his brother Olaf in the Battle of Stiklestad early on in his reign. Also with going to the um, Byzantian emperor at the time, becoming one of the Varangian guards and then having to slip away. He fought all over the Mediterranean throughout Russia and in parts of Scandinavia. And he was actually really quite an old man at the time of his invasion of England. So I definitely need to make another video about the life and times of Harald Hadrada. Hadrada meaning hard ruler or something along those lines because of his uh, notably famous hard rule. And he invaded obviously in 1066, one of the fatal invasions of that year, before of course the William the Conqueror, the Norman William the Bastard invaded in the south. And in 1066, he defeated the Northumbrian army with the help of the brother of Harold Godwinson called Tosti, and they defeated the Northumbrian army at the Battle of Fulford. And they were, this Fulford is not very far outside of York. I think it's actually um, one of the sort of um, outlying areas in the city of York. It's just a bit outside of the actual city. Although in 1066, of course, he wanted to create another kingdom of York, he really wanted to capture the entire throne of England after he had failed to take over the Danish throne, which was ruled by Svein at the time. 
Although in 1066, shortly after his victory at the Battle of Fulford, the Anglo-Saxon army rallied under Harold Godwinson and marched north. They were in the south because they were expecting William to invade, but then Harold Hadrada invaded first. So the, then the English army marched north and caught them totally unawares and fought them and defeated them at the Battle of Stamford Bridge, where Harold Hadrada was killed, ending the last Norwegian attempt on the throne of or the throne, the earldom of York at the time. Now, of course, in 1066, the Normans invaded as well. It, very shortly after the Battle of Stamford Bridge, actually, Harold Godwinson had to move his army at lightning speed to reach the south coast to Sussex, where the um, Normans had invaded. But the Viking obsession with York and England as a whole didn't end with the Normans. And actually, in the um, 1070s, as well as up to 1085 or 84, which was the last attempt at invasion by the Danish king Svein Estridsson. The first one was with an Anglo-Saxon rebel because the Anglo-Saxons didn't take being taken over by the Normans very lightly. And actually, even after the Battle of Hastings, they were still rebelling in various forms, with various rebels like Harold the Wake or Edgar the Elder. And it's with Edgar the Elder that Svein Estridsson tried to take over, and he invaded York twice, but the Normans bought him off. And the final time was just a few years before his death, in I believe it was 1085 or 1086, and they were finally defeated, ending sort of the Norwegian, the Danish, um, obsession with York in the North. I'd like to end today's video by reading a little bit from The Edge of the Worlds, which is a book by Michael Pye, which I would highly recommend that you read. It essentially tells the story of the North Sea and the people who lived around the North Sea and how the people there adapted to it and used it and how it has influenced the history there. So the first chapter is about the Frisians, essentially about how they revitalized trade and invent reinvented money after the Romans left the area. Then you have things like the spread of monasteries and their writing of religious books and copying and the book trade, whereas the third chapter gets into the Vikings and what they did in their more brutal raiding period of the sort of the late 8th, early 9th century, and then goes on to how they settled and influenced things. And then later on, the book goes into detail about er other trading organizations like the Hanseatic League and things like that. So I'd highly recommend it, but I'm going to read to you from page 104, which is in the chapter called Settling, which is about the Vikings and the more specifically the Scandinavians settling down in Europe. York because I really think it captures something about what the city might have been like. And yet the Vikings were never secure in Ireland, their kingdom, even their empire, was always elsewhere or on the seas. Their towns looked outwards. In 866, their great heathen army broke into England and took Aethelwich, which was a tiny town with a school, an archbishop, and a port of sorts, the religious centre for the kingdom of Northumbria. When they left, the town was Jorvik, which became York, grown in less than a century to a thriving, stinking city, all cesspits and middens and waste, where the hot metal industries were alive and thriving as they had not been since Roman times, smelting iron, silver and gold, turning lead into glass. There were craftsmen making combs from bone or antler, shoemakers and saddlers, jewellers working in amber and jet black jet. The scatter of houses on open spaces had been organised into streets and plots, a new plan which owed nothing to the Roman city on the same spot. The city also got its parish churches in Viking times, or most of them, for Norsemen and archbishops alike wanted independence from the English kingdoms, and power of their own, so they worked together. The Archbishop of York was once besieged alongside the Norse King Olaf, who was on a murderous but profitable raid into England at the time, and this was when Olaf was still a pagan, not yet baptised under English influence. The city had such a separate character, a mix of Anglo and Scandinavian, that it was furiously resistant later to the Norman invasion of England, Norsemen's descendants against Norsemen's descendants. For the moment, the Vikings needed York as a military base, but they were ploughing, according to the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, for 876, and were providing for themselves. Just as Dublin was pulling in craftsmen and merchants, laying out streets and defining zones for industry, so in York the Viking influence made a city from a settlement. A city means a choice of pleasures, some for the belly. There were seeds of dill, celery, opium, poppy and coriander, all kinds of spices. There were puffball mushrooms to eat, a luxury out of the woods. There were bees for honey, chickens scratching in yards, oysters in quantity, and sometimes mussels, cockles, winkles, and whelks. There were herring and eel for everyday eating, but there was also cod and haddock from the seas, sturgeon and salmon, and the state of the bones suggests that the Vikings knew how not to overcook fish. 
Wine came from the Rhine, soapstone vessels from Scotland, even brooches made by Pictish craftsmen who somehow escaped the various Viking slaughters of their countrymen. Through Denmark came the world, the silver coins of Samarkand, the silks of Byzantium, the cowrie shell currency of the Red Sea. The base coins of Northumbrian times became pennies rich in silver, coins which managed to muddle together the Viking sword, the hammer of the god Thor, and some inspirational Christian messages. The city is crammed beyond expression, the life of St. Oswald says, and enriched with the treasures of merchants who come from all parts, but above all from the Danish people. There was also a point on the river bank at York called Divilistanes, or Dublin Stones, which suggests a landing place for ships from Dublin, still the closest thing the Vikings had to a capital city. Alright everyone, so thank you very much for watching. I hope you have enjoyed this video about the Scandinavians in York, Viking York, or whatever you'd like to call it. I hope you do um, check out some of my other videos if you haven't seen them, and that you give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Comment anything you're not sure about in the comment section below. And I'll be happy to get back to you if and when I have the time. So thanks very much for watching. I've been History with Hilbert. And I hope you tune in again next time.